guys, just kind of as, a, as, as an initial preamble, um, Chloe and I had, had like known Barnett for a while and I had the opportunity to meet Henry uh, a few months ago and, and go on the podcast that they've launched, um, which is pretty, yeah, which is pretty amazing. And so wanted to kind of spend this opportunity um, to kind of give them a platform to talk about what they've built. I think Henry, we talked like 15 minutes afterwards and I had no idea kind of how big the Better World kind of platform was and what you guys were doing, um, which is very much kind of in line with this like larger Slack group that we've, that we've launched in this time and kind of the general channel that we've launched. Um, so I will, I will hand it over to you guys. Um, just to quickly introduce why you started the podcast um, and then we can go from there and, and ask a couple more questions about what your, your bigger vision, your takeover of Amazon. Burnett, you had a great introduction in the Slack channel. Um, yeah, and then it like, it like hit everyone with all those links. It was like auto link mania up in there. Yeah. <laughs> it, it mortified me on Slack. <laughs> and I, I quickly got over it. <laughs> so, so what Henry, is uh, Barnett's the diva and talent in the relationship. <laughs> um, I, well, why did we start Better World? Well, I mean, so Better World is a podcast. I mean, that's what it, that, like, that's the form that it takes now. Um, we really like set out just to talk to people like yourselves, Chloe and Stuart, who are like building companies and or have projects that are making the world better, which is why we called it a better world. Um, it came out of a, a trip that we took, although Henry, you didn't go on this trip now that I'm remembering it. It was like July in Panama in a jungle and it was like super hot. Oh no, no go, we back, were, go back further than that. <laughs> go, t wait. Tell them the good story. What is that? You go, I don't remember. <laughs> Barnett got wasted in a Nicaraguan jungle and made best friends with Dave Grossman. And Dave Grossman came to us. Oh, yeah. um, uh, he was the founder of a hotel um, and a furniture collective that was uh, taking, um, reclaiming rainforest wood uh, and turning it into, you know, usable products. Um, so Barnett and I got um, uh, basically recruited by Dave um, uh, to, you know, help him save the world in some capacity. And, um, it started with an agroforestry project where we uh, began to try and help raise funds uh, to purchase land and uh, help rehabilitate farmers in conjunction with a few people who had been doing this, like really interesting doctors and scientists who had been doing this for you know 30 years. Um, and there were organizations, like we've had them on the pod, like Simplementing My Data, um, who've been doing it in conjunction with um, uh, family offices that are you know basically coffee barons. Um, so they treat, uh, teach farmers how to reclaim land and how to plant coffee and cacao. Um, and what we noticed when we first started getting into this very, very difficult business, which we're still, you know, like barely putting a toe in, um, was that at some point in order to make massive change, we had to shift uh, the perspective of the consumer. So two years ago in change, Barnett and I decided that we had to do an omni-channel strategy for whatever D to C company we would build. And that omni-channel strategy um, was Better World. Uh, and Barnett came up with the idea, the logo, the branding, because he's a brilliant marketing genius guy. Um, and uh, he really, I attribute the concept almost entirely to him because he said that what we basically have to do is start highlighting net good people and net good companies. So not just this whole like NGO, you know, consistent push and climate bashing and like, you know, down with greenwashing and the, the uh, protest and like the, the Greta Thunberg approach, but more of the um, who's doing what and what are the practical things that we can do in our everyday life to make change. Um, so that's um, 51 podcasts later, we've interviewed uh, all of the best companies that we've been able to get our hands on talking about some of the best solutions, whether that's hydrocarbon fuel that you can turn uh, into a fossil fuel alternative or a diamond uh, to, you know, blue land cleaning supplies to sustainable fashion um, and recycle tech um, uh, to, to, to sex products and, and, and gender norms and sex education. Um, it, like we, we kind of spanned everything that we could touch that we thought was in inherently making the world better. Um, yeah, it's but, not just uh, like an environmental you know, like thing. Easy, you can jump in at any time. Yeah, yeah, that's an important distinction. It's not just like about the environment, although like that's a huge part of it. And that's like where Henry and I shared passion around it in the beginning. But it really like, we love having conversations about like 
gender identity and, and what that is and, you know, why educating people about how maybe that's a spectrum and not binary, for example, is, is important in making the world better too. So like, um, it's taken a lot of different shapes. It, it's people and environment. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. That's awesome. Well said. And so right now it's, it's conversations with founders. Um, what else kind of have you guys built around the ecosystem too? Is it, and, and what's sort of coming well, it's, up? It's a little bit more than that, which is, it's, it's a little bit more than that even as it stands now. Um, it just hasn't been released into the wild because it's been such a challenge. Um, so what we did was decide that we were also going to be a net good D2C company ourselves. So um, we started sourcing uh, agroforestry products from Bolivia, Nicaragua, Panama, um, and uh, El Salvador. Um, and what we focused on first was coffee, but there are all of these other products that we have that are available like coconut oil, coconut flour, um, acai, uh, quinoa, superfoods, um, nuts, um, and all of these things are grown in processes that combat desertification uh, with organizations who are in some capacity certified to do this. So um, we've spent the majority of our time um, outside of the podcasting um, preparing to launch these products as well as a site that has all of the products of the people that we interviewed on the podcast so that in some capacity we can start becoming the Amazon of net good things or at least just offering a solution to people who are trying to figure out how they purchase a whole variety of net good things and need to uh, need to have some sort of like almost consumer report validation on it. Um, and as much as we want to get deeper on that, we also recognize that we have a tremendous amount of work to do in things like um, behavioral change around carbon, um, quote unquote, offsets. So we created something that um, allows you to uh, pay down your carbon debt when you ship a product, when you rent a car, um, when you buy an airline ticket. Um, and it's a plugin, it's a Chrome extension that you just install on your website. Um, and it then allows you to donate and we give the money directly to the um, uh, organizations like Nika France uh, who uh, are planting trees in um, uh, the Central American, um, Latin American, Amazonian areas. Um, and what our, you know, what our honest hope has kind of always been, Barnett and I like kicked around the idea of doing a retail store. Um, he was very into it briefly. Um, for shopping experience. <laughs> retail would be a bad idea right um, now and make it this week. Yeah, geez. Thank, thank God. Thank God. <laughs> thank like, God we didn't do it. On his person. <laughs> Henry? Henry, where do you go, buddy? Yeah. So re retail. Well, yeah, so we, 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 we had thought about doing it because we were really inspired actually by, again, it goes back to like who we have on the podcast and who the community is. Like we had, um, I'm forgetting her name, Henry, but um, she was lovely. She had us at her store called Precycle, which is out in Bushwick on off Star Street, I think. And it's a zero waste market, like a corner bodega style market, except it's yeah. zero waste. Um, and all locally sourced. Literally, we're doing the podcast in her store because she couldn't step away from the store to come to us to podcast. So we went there and she kept having to take breaks because she had to help customers coming in like midday on a Tuesday. Like people were coming into this like zero waste bodega just like randomly in a random part of Bushwick on a Tuesday at 2.30 p.m. on the radar. It was like, it kind of was eye-opening for me. So I was like, you know, there's a real opportunity to create some energy around doing Better World as like a retail pop-up. Yeah. Um, now the logistics of that are obviously difficult and um, all of that. And so it, it hasn't happened yet, but it's something that we would love to explore. I think the 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 challenge that we've always had with with better world and, and more me because henry you're you're such a good driving force of it um more so than i am day to day these days but the challenge is is it's it's such a big idea and it's so we see like ways to make the world better and, and friends and and new people that come into our lives who are making the world better like we want to work with all of them <laughs> and we want to give all of them a platform 
and like we're focusing more on that sometimes than we are on like what is better world as a entity mm -hmm. um and that's really like the challenge that we have like um i don't know if that's helpful to the conversation but that's no it is i i think what i'm really interested here to like learn a little bit more about you guys have these like incredible as well like how, how do you how do you meet these how do you like meet the guy in the amazon that other than other than like getting drunk and going to nicaragua which I, you know like <laughs> how do you how are these relationships form like how do you find these things me so we actually took a trip down to well the same nicaragua crew basically like after nicaragua broke, broke out into civil war a lot of businesses down there that were owned by expats kind of had to like either shut down or or rethink themselves because Nicaragua is not um, a terribly consistent place to do business. Uh, that may have changed recently, I'm not sure, but it was like that for a while. Um, so we, we took a trip down to Panama to live on an on a agro forest uh, plantation where they grow um, different types of trees using this method called generation forestry. And we kind of like went down as an expedition, like there was a whole bunch of different types of people, um, cross-functional group of people, not unlike the Slack group that um, Nate started here. And um, and we went down and we talked to people in the business down there. We talked to growers. We talked to indigenous populations up in the hills um, about the challenges that they have in their businesses. And like a lot of that is like where the inspiration comes from. and and spending a week in a place like that or two weeks in a place like that you meet people who are in the business of connecting you to growers and um different types of families that have viable businesses in that in those countries like and and that's just what i've noticed like henry does a lot more traveling than i do down there so he can probably speak to it um a little bit more granularly but i mean you got to go down there you know you gotta you gotta network what was your personal connection so there's yeah. Go no, finish it. the question. You're. Oh, yeah, like, what was the personal connection? Okay. Nicaragua, Panama. It just. A, well, A, eventually we'd love to get into because you both have really interesting career paths prior to this. Um, yeah. But how did we, like, how did that even come about? It was, it was a series of trips. Yeah, Nicaragua happened through. Um, so basically, I got a phone call from. Go for it, Henry. <laughs> you got it. You got it. It's just, a, it's a delay. It's a lag. I may be, or may not be in Hawaii. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to ask you. I don't even know where the fuck you are. Um, Nicaragua, because of Madeiras Collective, which was a hotel group mm -hmm. and furniture uh, manufacturing company, um, it has done beautiful work. Our friend Dave Grossman, um, was the founder, is or was the founder of Madeira's Collective, which was headquartered um, out of Nicaragua. Um, Dave has since, has always been a huge supporter of what we do, but like Dave has since had to uproot his companies and move them to Panama, which is a lot more stable um, business environment than Nicaragua and has different businesses. I think he has a sea cucumber farm now in Panama so um it really that's like that's how it starts like we have a really close friend there and then um you know like through Dave we we meet some other people and take trips down there and that's been happening for the past I don't know five plus years so it, it's we've developed a network basically yeah that's the that's the good short answer of it um uh I went down to um, uh, El Salvador through a friend that was working in Guatemala um, and took a look at a place, started meeting some locals and started making contacts and networking. For the agroforestry stuff, it's very much a feed on the ground, explore it and see what alternatives and solutions you can find. Um, and we have to make a concerted effort um, to help bring a direct to consumer economy to farmers who are caretakers of rainforest. Like that's a big, big thing that we have to do and it's very hard. Um, but, um, and it won't be too hard. We, we, but um, uh, our, 
Better World community up here is fostered by the people who are doing things like uh, Arcadia, uh, Lawrence Singer, uh, Package Free Shop. Um, we meet a, a number of people, um, uh, Gabe Kennedy plan people. Uh, there, there's so many of them that we meet that are just uh, through the network of conscious minded individuals who are pa passing along um, these people to, to talk more about this. And what we're finding is that the more that we, uh, the more episodes that we do and the more companies that we talk about, the more companies kind of show up and want to be part of the conversation. So I guess like our big ask, um, you know, for everybody on this call is, um, is to take the conversation into your own life and to help further it, you know, with friends and family and talk about products that you can kind of shift and use. Um, I, I happen to think that this particular viral hiccup, um, uh, pandemic disaster, um, uh, is, and worst crisis, um, in our health system, um, in the last, you know, hundred years, um, is a prelude to what we're going to see, unfortunately, with climate change, um, with mass migration, um, uh, with poor health care, with famine, uh, with all the bad things. So as much as we can do now um, uh, to create stabilization um, and create different economies, uh, it, it's going to impact us. Like we really want uh, Central America to be stable um, because uh, the you know, the, the climate caused food rush um, will come from there. We really want them yeah. to be stable because they're the stewards of one quarter of the earth's oxygen. Um, we want them to be stable because they're human. Um, and I, I feel like, uh, you know, in, in talking about the network, it's important also to talk about the growth of the network and the kind of things that we want everybody to do. I mean, great, start with listening to our pod, you know, like awesome, but um, literally, you know, take uh, inventory and stock of all the things that you have in your home and the things that you can switch to. And that's clothing, that's cleaning supplies, that's food, um, that's, that's paint. There is paint that will clean the air that is um, signif it's, uh, significantly better for you than um, uh, your average industrial alternative. Uh, and um, so it, it's literally everything. Um, but I uh, if you're- Yeah, you know, Nate, please. go. I have a lot of questions actually. For, well, first of all, um, sorry, I was on mute before, but um, but yeah, I feel like I haven't seen you in a really, really long time. So it's so cool that we're on Zoom chatting with each other years, years later. And Henry, yeah, Henry, I don't know if we ever, if we've met, I apologize. We probably have in the past, but um, I love what you guys are doing. And I think that there's so many big ideas that you, you're obviously um, trying to kind of bring down to earth and understand how to tackle um, for people who are like, much less sophisticated in their understanding of all of this. What is, like from, from a product perspective, if we look at it through that lens, what are certain product changes that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis that are easy to make a swap? Because I think like in order for this to, in order for change to be elicited at a really big, large scale has to start, unfortunately it has to start with something super, super easy, right, for people. What is that? Like you, you mentioned cleaning products, you mentioned um, just like, like is there something on a, oh, I can do this tomorrow without yeah. research, without a uh, significant financial um, contribution, without like, what is one thing that I could just take away and be like, wow, that's the anti-toilet paper hoarding, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I think, um, well, here's like a medium length answer to that. Um, cause there's like little ways that you could totally do it. One thing that we were, that Henry and I were very cognizant of is that there's a lot of people out there that don't really give a shit about like being zero waste or like oh, net yeah. positive well, or green. Not, right? Yeah. Most people don't. So like for us, it was, it's also nice when there are products and companies that are, um, mass that are inherently just like good and it it doesn't necessarily like being green or zero waste or net positive isn't really a part of their identity per se but like that is just inherent to their product so um those sorts of things are really great and we love to talk to people who are in the product business some of them are clients and 
tell them that, you know, just because you might not want to be eco doesn't mean that you can't do shit that's like more eco, you know, like you can change your packaging, you can um, rethink your supply chains and push your vendors to do different sorts of solutions that change your brand. Now, simple things that can be done. I, in my own life, I like to go room by room. So a couple months ago, um, well, maybe it's a year ago, I tried to go zero waste in my bathroom. So, um, does that mean shampoo you have my the day instead of toilet paper? No, I don't have that yet. <laughs> <laughs> zero waste. Oh, yeah, that's the easiest way to go zero waste in your bathroom. Come on, bro. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Always, this is just a bidet. It's it's all it's like been the top. She buy a bidet. She bought like a basic. What is that? What is that brand that does the? They're like they're like uh, even during the toilet paper thing, their like sales are increasing. The it's uh, what's it called? The fly, it sounds like a tech name, like Flushly or something. Tushy. <laughs> no. Tushy? Tushy? Yeah. Correct. Tushy. Not plushy. Tushy. What is it? Um, you can't Google it though. You Tushy. Can, you got it. I think it's like. If you act, if you type, if you I don't think, it I don't wrong, think it's, like, I don't, I don't think it's like tushy.com. It's like, that's, you roll, you roll. Yeah, dice. You tushy.com. Right, that's true. Uh, All right. So uh, bidet will, will me. happen tonight. Got me. Tushy.me. They're I started fine line there. They're walking a really, really fine line. <laughs> Nate, I didn't start with with my ass hygiene. Low I started with com. my hair hygiene. <laughs> it works its way down. Yeah, you start at the top. Hello, Tushy. Dot com. From the bottom up. I go ground up. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's it's it's why I've always liked you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, you know, I went from, um, I, I do like shampoo and conditioner bars, and I use bar soap. And then I um, started using, um, instead of cotton pads, like I do, I have like recycled ones that I got from Warren Singer's company. Um, unfortunately, it took like three weeks to get to me, but whatever. <laughs> uh, it's worth it. And, um, and little things like that. So I think like, that's one way to, to, to go about it. Yeah. I, it's just a challenge to do better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Henry, in talking more about um, uh, jobs and economic stability in terms of climate change, um, it's interesting to us because we at Thousand Bell we manufacture in Brazil, and in a small a small town in the state of São Paulo, and then a lot of our supply chain is also. Um, in Europe, I think right now, though, in total, we source from six countries. Um, but particularly, we see it where the majority of footwear manufacturing and footwear factories are. They are in developing countries in second or third tier satellite cities. Yeah. Um, and and how, how, how you work with local governments, how you think about keeping people employed, what responsibility do businesses, or do you think businesses have in the cities and towns that they manufacture in? Um, open discussion here, but would- That's but a I, big question. That's a big question. That's, that's, <laughs> that's big, that's big like Stuart's eyes, big. What if, what, what if we- But I, 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 when you talk, we've already, you've already brought up and we've scratched the surface with like, there was a lot of job insecurity and food insecurity in Nicaragua post the Civil War. How do we get people jobs? Um, without- yeah, no, 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 no. I can, I can, I can dig right into it. Yeah, I, I'm, just, I'm just joking. Um, uh, <laughs> there is a, uh, an organization in El Salvador that I visited um, uh, in February prior to um, you know, the last of this. Um, uh, it is a former investment banker and one of the old coffee growers. They are um, uh, raising a $40 million fund, uh, most through uh, uh, equity, but uh, um, uh, also through private markets, um, that is going to rehabilitate the coffee sector. Um, So it is private money coming in um, to take over a sector um, that was um, uh, claimed by the government in the 70s and now is producing the lowest amount of coffee uh, they have produced ever in their history since the 1890s. The industry has fallen apart. So um, I think it is the responsibility of governments. Bolivia, for example, has created a heavy number of incentives um, for sustainable agriculture. Um, uh, and there's a ton that uh, the governments can do. But um, uh, myself and Dave Grossman are going to be flying to Arkansas when this lifts. We were supposed to do it in, in 
the middle of March. That didn't happen. Um, uh, and we're going to meet with the Waltons. Um, so looking at some of these privatized organizations that are raising major amounts of capital in order to solve these problems uh, is um, uh, where I think part of the future lies. Um, and job creation is going to come from private organizations who are um, scaling and expanding in really wonderful and sustainable ways. A good example I can give um, are some of the fincas in uh, Nicaragua and um, in El Salvador. Uh, they are expanding through programs that train uh, destitute farmers who abandoned land and like moved into urban centers um, to come back and rehabilitate them. And they're giving them um, some of the, uh, the crops and they're giving them uh, the know-how and the teaching and the job training um, in order to do this. Now, uh, our partner, Dave Grossman, who just recently raised funds um, for, uh, for sea cucumbers, um, he and his partner, James Widener, have been working with former fishermen and farmers, both in the Panamanian region, but also in like the Northeast, um, and training these fishermen um, to get into uh, aquaculture, raise kelp farms, raise mollusks, um, um, needlefish, uh, things of that nature. So I, I see that the economies of, uh, of, the, of the new climate order uh, are being created in, in the same you know, capitalist private market models. And I think they have to be helped with government to a large, large, large extent. And what we basically are going to have to do on a government basis is pay people to combat desertification, deforestation, um, and some of the other climate challenges that we have. The other, but and you know, the one other of the major thing, ones, of course, is desertification to combat first. Henry, though, everything I so I told him you were like spot on. And you're so knowledgeable about this, and the thing that I would add to it is also like access to lending and credit yeah. for certain non-traditional entities that control a lot of the land in like the Pan American Verde in particular. Like a lot of a lot of that land is controlled by um, tribes or tribal people. Like, like they're not like businesses in the way that um, a lot of other initiatives are set up. And but that doesn't make it any less valid that they need access to credit so that they can employ themselves. Like, there's a self-employment thing too that's missing, um, and putting um, the stewards of the land right at a disadvantage as well. So. Um, you know, that became apparent on one of the trips that we took um, in, in Panama, where we met um, a tribe that was growing many different types of things on their land. As jungles do, they produce a lot of different types of products, right? Like coffee, but like different types of bark and shit like that. And, um, and the coffee in particular was a sticking point because what they would do, it's low grade coffee. And so the buying, the buyer for low grade coffee is buyers in India. And the Indian buyers would wait until the end of the harvest, right before the coffee rotted, to short the price, basically. And the, the fix for it is so simple. They just needed a silo to store the coffee so it wouldn't rot. But they couldn't afford, they couldn't get credit to build a silo, which only costs like $2,700 US. You guys mind if I try from somewhere, yeah. like a completely different yeah. angle? Um, yeah. Like I, I, so I come from a, a very different sector than probably most people here. I come from the uh, blockchain slash crypto side. Um, and so what's, what's been cool about um, the projects I've seen coming out of South America is the idea that, you know, access to credit, access to kind of just connections to VC funds in general are really hard to come by. Um, if you have no outside connections, you have to go through another kind of third party to make the connections. Everyone takes a cut every single, every uh, step of the way. Um, what's been cool to see is actually doing, um, I don't know if you guys remember, there's something called ICOs, which is like an IPO, but for tokens, um, which mm -hmm. is big cryptocurrency. What some people have done now uh, is actually launch their own coffee coins, right? So I'm going to, instead of... Um, Instead of knowing that, uh, instead of going from a harvest now, I'm actually going to pre-sell uh, part of my coffee bags, beans, uh, know exactly who I'm going to, um, 
and pre-sell that before I actually go in and, and start farming, right? And so this, this allows local farmers to really kick that off and make sure they have the startup capital before they really spend time and, and resources and energy in, in, you know, in the agriculture. Um, it's been really effective to, to see them launch their business without uh, just kind of on their own. And so it, it sort of empowers in, in the grassroots way the problem that we're seeing here is really coordination. How do we actually make sure that the farmers know, um, you know, how to do this? Uh, the developer resources are lacking. Um, and in the same way that, you know, you see an opportunity, uh, developers see this and say, okay, well, we'll take 70% of all the money that you raise. You take the 30% because that's already what you need. Um, and that strips profits away from them. But I think we, you know, if there's some way that, you know, we can start to, Kind of revamp that a little bit, and and I was I've had a couple of conversations with the UNICEF Innovation Fund. Um, so my organization actually does work with them. We we help them start the crypto fund. Um, I had a chat this morning with the UNDP. I know they have Innovator Labs, but it, it's still like there's still kind of this cultural and language barrier that has been so hard for us to help kind of break down. Uh, that even if even if this is the ideal you know uh, capital raise for them, uh, they're unable to do so you know, for whatever technical or, or language cultural barriers. Um, and, and something that, you know, it, it's, it's hard to, in technology, right, especially open source tech, you think that, you know, if you, if you build it uh, and you have the ideal optimal thing, um, you know, anyone can adopt it and use it. But we see that that's just not the case, right? You can build the best thing, you know, the, the best solution for, you know, any sort of scenario, um, but if you don't have the resource to actually use it or you don't have the actual, I guess, uh, conducive environment uh, for that to, to grow or to be leveraged, it means nothing. And, and so, so it's, it's like um, the white knight issue in Africa, right? Where, you know, there are a lot of different countries coming in saying like, we know how to fix this problem. And I think there, there was a Bill Gates documentary on Netflix about it too, or, or there was one episode where he mentions this where, you know, everyone tries to create a solution for a problem that you see that you can fix, but without being on the ground, it's hard to actually know what the specific nuances of that problem are. Um, I don't know, just throwing open questions out there. No, it's super insightful. I mean, it, it, that's the thing. It's like, there's so many ways to crack that nut. I think using technology at, at a high level and the question is like, how does that actually iterate on the ground? It's always the biggest challenge. Um, I don't have the answer for it, <laughs> but, but um, the thing, you know. Can you ex explain that a little bit? So these, and, um, these ICOs for coffee, how are they run? Are they managed? Is there a platform for them that the UN is building? Yeah, I can actually link that to you. Uh, I think it's called coffee tokens. It's the cafe tokens. Um, give me a second. I'll find it. Um, so what it is, is essentially it's, it's, <laughs> I don't want to get too much in the crypto economics of it, but it, it's done on a, a binding curve. So what you do is you pre buy a token that represents the redemption of a bag of coffee. So in that case, you know, you, as long as you can pre sell it, you have enough startup capital to, um, make all this happen. But what's interesting about a bonding curve in the crypto economics is um, if more people buy at a high fidelity, the price of the coffee is dynamic. So it'll actually go up based on the demand of the coffee. So knowing who's building the, who's, who's making the coffee from what farms uh, from what region in South America, um, the platform allows you to kind of sell your own, I guess your own brand of coffee, kind of like a Kickstarter. Uh, but in the crypto economics, like, uh, dynamic behind it, it allows you to make sure that the amount of money that you make it, that you make from the coffee is enough to at least cover the startup costs. Um, and then there's the next hurdle of like, you know, branding, you know, what, what is the coffee? How are you making sure that your, your, um, your coffee is actually good? Uh, that adjusts the price based on how many people are actually buying it at what time frame. Um, and how soon you sell out of it. Uh, Cause at one point, I think the, the coffee I bought from Nicaragua most recently, it was up at $117 uh, when, you know, the, the first bag of coffee I think was $12. Um, but it, it's like really good coffee. So, you know, like I, I can't not buy it. Um, so it, it's cool to kind of see and, and the platform itself is open source. <laughs> so anyone can kind of take it and, and run with it. Um, 
but again, it's the same problem of like, you know, it is open source. Uh, it is a tool that's free for anyone to use. Um, but then the problem is how do you make sure that enough farmers have eyes on this and are able to actually onboard to the platform? Uh, and the team that built it is based out of uh, Honduras and uh, Nicaragua. So they, they have good footing with a lot of the local farmers. Um, but if they can kind of expand that network, uh, that'd be really cool. And as much as we try to do that in, in terms of what we do at the Ethereum Foundation, um, we can only go so far because we're in, you know, we, we all have our own little bubbles of who we, you know, talk to, right? So for us, it's, it's whatever, who's ever in the tech scene, um, in the crypto scene, VCs, right? And like, how much coffee can we reasonably use, right? It's not like we're going to go to Starbucks and say like, hey, buy some of this. It, it just wouldn't work that way, unfortunately. That's really interesting. Barnett, have you guys looked at anything like a crowdsourcing or, or crypto run funding option for the farms? and manufacturers that you're working with no i haven't i i don't know henry if you if you thought about it i mean i remember talking to, to dave a little bit about that early on henry yeah. like when we were talking about forestry and how to fund um some of the protection of the forest because like regeneration forestry is like a 20 year plus proposition and so the ROI on, on an investment like that is pretty low. It takes a patient sort of investment to do that. So I think we were looking at um, other ways of um, raising capital that maybe involved crypto, but uh, not yeah. not specifically as it pertains to uh, coffee. Helping farmers with micro lending. And helping farmers. Yeah, it, yeah, it wasn't. Wait, it wasn't can like it, that. is there anything like that right now where you as an investor could buy a stake, a longer term stake in a forest or a natural resource? I don't know of any, but that would be really cool. If you could, that, if you could that actually, be, yeah. we, we have a tiny, <laughs> tiny investment in a cryptocurrency. That's a long, long term investment, but something- We're all gonna be rich. It's gonna be <laughs> <laughs> that's the dream, right? <laughs> we are really long on block stack, which we'll talk to you offline about. Um, <laughs> But um, but it'd be really interesting, I think, in, with this thought what that better world has of how do we protect against deforestation and how do we tie commerce to protecting deforestation to maybe link that with ICOs for natural resources. Yeah, Absolutely. that'd actually be really cool to see. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you up, Barnett. No. Oh, no, I, I, I was going to say the same thing in my own way of speaking, but um, the... I remember seeing like there are like eco coins. I don't know. I don't think they're called eco coins, but like that's what uh, my yeah, brain is remembering. That. Um, and then it makes me think of a conversation we had along uh, maybe a few months ago or last year with Conservation International, which does really good work um, around. I mean, they do like the most jungle preserving, I think, out of any of the organizations that I know of. So I think that, um, you know, there's, my point is that there's no short of, a, of access to organizations that on our end of on organizations that can really make a difference. I think those sorts of organizations have always lacked in speed and know-how um, as it pertains to these sort of technologies. So, you know, connecting the dots is something that um, could be really interesting for sure. Oh, I see that link. Yeah, I just posted a link for Affogato Coffee. Uh, these are the guys that okay, cool. are on the platform. Um, yeah, so they, occasionally they just do coffee sales, and it, they're all limited drops of you know different farmers. You can read about the farms. Uh, what's cool about this is you can actually with blockchain check um, you know where the farms are, uh, who's doing it, and you can check the whole supply chain. And that that's pretty cool for uh, fair trade. Um, and then if, if you want to get really freaky with it, um, there's something called the decentralized exchange where if you have a cafe token, you could switch, you could trade it for something else. Uh, if you don't want to redeem your coffee and you want to sell that because now, you know, this is a hot selling coffee, uh, sell it for more money or, you know, you kind of go in between. Um, but you can also get into this weird thing where someone is, you know, didn't ICO on the t-shirt. You can just trade a coffee for a t-shirt or like two coffees for one t-shirt. Uh, but it, it, it's fun that way, right? You can start engaging in different ways. Um, but I, I definitely, it would be really cool to, to tie that into some conservation method. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Hey, Marie, do you have a question? 
Yeah, sure. I wanted to ask, um, ultimately, all of these conversations land back with the consumer in some way. So I'm interested in hearing input on consumer at the end of, at the end of all this. In my view, I kind of see it going one or two very different ways. I think that on one side, the consumer may desperately miss brick and mortar, where it did serve as an entertainment site where somebody could go and look around and touch and feel and see people and talk to people. On the other side, they've learned lots of things that they can do independent of the physical space. I see luxury for the ones that still have a lot of money. I still see that they want to get out. There's going to be parties, get dressed, be that way. On the other side, I see... You know, even in luxury, you could go and buy the seven key pieces from Ralph Lauren and only buy those for five years and never have anything else. So I'm very curious to see what people's feelings are on either one of those spectrums. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can talk about this for hours. Um, fashion and this is why better world becomes such a interesting project because you know we're going we're now shifting from um you know coffee currency and stuff like that and helping people in panama to fashion which is you know the second most polluting industry in the world so um i think that consumers i think as it pertains to um products that are better for the world uh, it, it, it touches again on like something that Nate and I were talking about earlier which is that I think some consumers care about that and other consumers don't and um, and it's always great to educate consumers and let them discover that products are are good and good performing and then functional and then also good for the world um, and that can be done through content um, to certain demographics but can really be done well in retail. Um, so I think it's about adapting <clears throat> the principles of um, like millennial generation and younger, which has is proven to show affinity towards brands that they share values with, and then creating stories that embody that narrative. I mean, like Stuart and Chloe's company is like a perfect example of this, where like it's a good shoe, right? I mean, like underneath it, it's like really good for the world, but it's also just a good product, right? And so like anyone who wants a good um, leisure sneaker can, can buy a thousand dollars. Like whether yeah. or not their intention is to, is to make the world better. Like that might not be their intention. Do you have any feelings on whether it will be that they will have an insatiable desire for, um, for products after this in, in terms of whether even picking the best ones or will people be kind of lazy like, hey, those that's always worked for me. I'll just kind of use that. I'm just trying to climb into the <clears throat> consumer head. And there's part one of that. Part two of this is even look at for myself. I've had enormous behavioral changes in the past two weeks. Some things that kind of like shock me. It's like Little House on the Prairie. I am freezing blueberries and raspberries. And I never did, I, I mean, I feel horrible. I used to throw up broccoli if I didn't need it in time. Never thought to freeze broccoli. And my sister will call and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like freezing broccoli. She's like, hell just froze over. What are you doing? I mean, I've really been resourceful. I go to bed earlier. Like I've heightened, way heightened everything about health. I take 90 vitamins a day. I walk two hours a day. And I also think that this is the prime opportunity. If you want to reach people about a product, even like Thousand Fell, this is your window. They're not distracted. I think we have people's attention for a very short period of time before they bolt out again and go, you know, and have some kind of big experience in the outside world. So I just feel like this this is a very special time to hit it. And I don't yeah, think I, people are afraid because they're afraid of being self-promotional, but I don't think there should be any fear right now about being self-promotional because I think that this is an opportunity to educate and that people should jump on it. People have been soliciting me for all kinds of things and I've been, I've been answering people, things I don't even need, want, but I know somebody on the other end believes in it and really wants to get it out there and they, 
they need that. So I think there's this dance between promotion and non-promotion. And let me know about companies now, right now, that could change the way I am as a consumer. Um, because this was an interesting change for me. I'm 58 years old and I never really, I've not done some self-care that I think I needed, like freezing damn blueberries, so that every day in that shake, I've got some, I'm like, yeah, see, no excuse. And I'm not going out and buying it. I'm not going out and getting it with the plastic cup. I'm not doing any of the bad behavior. And I'm kind of really proud of myself in a very stressful time. Mm. And this is very, I think, capitalize on this, guys, because it is magic if you do. Mm. That's, that's my little jib jab. It's so hard. Thank you for sharing, Marie. We've also chopped up fresh vegetables and frozen them the last week. <laughs> I'm not wasting anything because they're so nervous about running out of food. I know, nothing. Um, it's very hard to know. We actually um, had this small business call earlier this week. During well, the I tried to jump on that, but I couldn't yeah. make it. Yeah. yeah, no, of course. But like when and how is it right to talk about products during this time frame? So actually a question I had for Barnett, and you had mentioned at the beginning of the call that you guys are soon to launch the platform, hopefully. But it's just, it's hard to figure out when in the next, you know, even two to six months, it will be right to pivot towards talking about products again versus talking about helping a community. And that's something that we even at Thousands and All have, have been kind of grappling with the last week. We paused advertising um, for the product to the website. We paused off Facebook and Instagram advertising. We pivoted more to community and then, and then charity and trying to figure out how we can give back. Um, mm. But you know, I think I, the next step is education then. If uh, this is my, as a consumer, I'm talking not as much as a professional right now. You guys know what I do, but I'm thinking more as a, as a consumer that you once kind of feel it out because if you watch, I didn't want to interrupt you, I'm sorry, but if you, Anderson Cooper had um, Sanjay on, Gupta, and they talked about that we're going through the seven stages of grief right now. And what's happening is everyone's going through different stages at different times. But like in the morning, you could be completely optimistic. By the nighttime, you could walk, wake up at three o'clock in the morning and be like, oh my God, is this ever going to be over? So I think if you look at those seven stages and every day take a little bit of a temperature of the stages of seven stages of grief and, and look at them and feel, try to feel where the world is at the moment, where, what people are ready for. I think, yes, it was very safe and courteous and respectful in the beginning and a little scared, community for sure. But now in little ways, because you have an opportunity to educate that a lot of other people don't. Um, if, you're, if you're, I don't know, make it up, Cartier, and you're just putting out rings, you're not educating. You guys can educate and do it in kind of little little spoonfuls and get people to kind of have a new awareness, you know, that's my take, but um, you have to judge that for based on what you're getting is like feedback, even from your social media, kind of feel it out. Um, but I think we have to let go of some fear. And I absolutely think we have to let go of all judgment. I don't think today and right now is the time for judgment. People are doing different things that are right for different people and you'll know what's right for you. Awesome. Wow. So well spoken. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that focus on education. Barnett, yeah. really quickly, just in the last couple of minutes, um, when are you guys planning to launch the consumer facing platform? How can people get involved? Are you pivoting well, to education like Marie just spoke about? Well, there's an education component in, in just what we do on the podcast. Like we always try and end the podcast with like a very actionable takeaway that um, the listeners can do. So like, you know, for a thousand fell, it's like, well, you, there's other options for footwear that are great. Like you should buy it and or follow support. Like for on the other side of that equation, like for people like you guys who um, are, you know, part of a community, like one way to support us is to introduce us to more people like yourselves who have projects and businesses like themselves so that we can bring them into the family and, and figure out other ways to support them. Um, it's not overtly about like 
selling your product. Like we had one founder on our podcast who um, has an amazing company called uh, Blue Land. And it's um, like, What's she's an amazing Sarah? Blue Land. Yeah. Yeah, Sarah. I'm so impressed by her. She's like, she's, she's incredible, right? Like she's an amazing founder. Oh, like, cool. yeah. I think I know. I've seen this stuff, yeah. Yeah, and the way they launch it, like she's built like a solid like community around her, like yeah, yeah, yeah. and from from Azo and like does the PR for them, I think, and like she's built like a good crew of people, and um, you know, I just like it supported her in any way I could. It wasn't like fundamental to her business, but like there were like introductions that I made. Like that's that's for me. That's like a great thing that Better World could do is just like leverage me and Henry as people and then like widen out the community in terms of actually like building up a commerce platform. I think we're pretty far away from that. Like it takes resources. It takes, you know, like better world isn't a company, it, it, right? It's not incorporated. It's like this thing that, you know, has just kind of developed into what it is today. Like our dream and our vision is to do that. Um, and I, I think the timing would be great right now to do it, but like, you know, it doesn't have to happen right now either. So I, I don't have a specific answer for you, Chloe. Like, um, I wish it could be next week. I wish it could be next quarter, <laughs> but um, it's, it, it is what we're able to put into it at any given time, you know, like that's, that's how this project is structured. Very cool. Which is great that it's lasted this long. Like it's lasted two years more. That's awesome. Guys, I want to open it up. I know we're kind of at the hour mark. I wanted to open it up. I know I've kind of been like muting everybody, but um, if anybody has any questions uh, for Barnett or, or, or whatnot, we can also all, all connect on Slack too. But just want to I just wanted to say one last thing that I thought of for Thousandfeld and for a better world that I think would be interesting is based on values, education around values instead of product. So in other words, if you have Thousandfeld fans, people like love Thousandfeld, ask them, not about their shoes, ask them, tell us one thing that you've changed in your life that's made a big difference, that's aligned with the values of you, so that your group, can, your followers can start to say, wow, okay, I'll, I'm going to make that change in something in my daily routine. And you're not selling the shoes, you're selling values. And I think that could be a game changer. And that people could be drawn there to look and say like, oh, I didn't think that I could, I don't know, make up whatever. That, and that's a game changer. That, that can change in my life. And then that's how you build your tribe is that these people are aligned with my values. I want to be part of the Thousandfeld value tribe. tribe. This makes sense to me. See what I mean? Does that make sense to you guys? Totally. And same thing for Better World. Like if you showed me more stuff or let me know about more people that are doing something and that the, one of the men said really earlier here, that's simple. Like what can I just do that, that's simple? And people really feel proud of themselves when they do something that's game changing and they don't feel overwhelmed. You just do like little things a lot of little things become a whole change lifestyle. This way you're not selling the shoes, you're selling values. So if you want to talk to me about that separately, it could be fun to do something. You know what I mean? Like you could bounce yeah. ideas off of me. 100% do something on that. That sounds fun. Maybe we have a whole yeah. call on it. Okay, call me or, or pop everybody on here. I'll put on some makeup. We're going to and... zoom you. We're going to zoom you. We're going to zoom you. You have to have your video on. <laughs> we're going Wednesday I know. I look kind of scary today. Uh, for those that don't know, Marie Griffin is one of the uh, like preeminent media trainers and messaging experts oh, in the okay. world. Thanks. Thank you. That's so nice. You can Great make me cry. And CEOs and... When you started talking about the seven stages of grief, I was like, I've tuned, I'm now, I've entered the chat. I'm pouring a glass of wine and we're going to talk. For <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it was really fascinating. And we are going through seven stages of grief. I mean, it is one. Where are we currently at, would you say? You know? is, there like a, is there like a blanket stage that we're all kind of collectively feeling right now? It's week two. Like, think about that. It's week two. What are we feeling? Um, I'm feeling angry. <laughs> no. it's, like, it's like the the excitement, the memes. It's like, okay, we're done. Now it's like now I'm pissed. I want to go outside. I'm angry. <laughs> I want to go outside. I took a walk and I saw that everyone was in the park and no one gave a shit. So now yeah. I'm mad. 
Stuart's dad every single day oh my God. sends us a picture through the blinds of his house and it's like my dad's become that old. Shelter old. in place doesn't apply to our neighbors. And he's just like so pissed shelter, off. Shelter in place applies to nobody in the South Williamsburg area at all. And I found okay. that out today. I, I'm like, am I the really? greatest person? Because I went, I walked by Domino Park. I mean, granted, I was guilty of doing what I think everyone else is doing. But the, it was like any given Friday afternoon, people yeah. chilling, playing volleyball, mm -hmm. gathering in very large packs. Here are the seven. That's crazy because that Here's happened in Italy. Right like, now. we didn't yeah. learn from that. Yeah. He's got the, 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 the mic. Let's return to the seven stages. Yeah, when I was yeah here are the seven. So you've got shock and denial, pain and guilt, anger and bargaining. I have to look okay. at that. We're anger and bargaining right now. <laughs> and depression, <laughs> reflection, and loneliness. Oh, shit. Then <laughs> upward turn, then reconstruction and working through, and then acceptance and hope. So we have a while to go, it sounds like. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, if any, did anyone watch Bill Gates on CNN? CNN. I saw bits and pieces of it. He's oh my, my gosh. Inviting light through all this. We didn't, we didn't catch it. It was so great. So Bill, who, Bill, like, we're, you know, Bill. I love him, <laughs> Bill. He's so good. So Bill was saying <laughs> that okay. we're looking, if we do, and my sister who is um, in the medical profession said, exactly this two weeks ago she's like if the world if you stopped everything no one moved for 10 weeks we could knock this thing out if we don't stop moving it will come back two and three times in 2020. Yeah. Well, so, even in south korea they, they they ended the quarantine people went back out and it spiked again and so now they have to, yeah. they have to go back into quarantine right so if we're in the seven stages of grief, we can't go through these seven stages three to two, three times in this 2020 and survive. Chloe, so everyone's just got to stay home. I'm, I'm really uh, worried. I'm, I'm like in the anger stage and also like I'm super inquisitive about the whole thing because like how is this going to affect like the global south of the world, right? Yeah. Like island nations, Mexico, people like that. And... <clears throat> because this is right now like certainly in the u.s like this is like a bourgeois mostly white disease right because those are the people who haven't really quarantined themselves and that's how it's spreading i witnessed um, that today it was really very that that exact crowd yeah um so how that ends up affect like in five months like how it affects um that global south i keep doing this but like th those people is going to be really interesting and then how it affects like you know i'm already like if i see people who i think are like bourge the bourgeois white and or like ultra modern orthodox walking on the same side of the sidewalk i cross the street like i'm already like racist against that but i don't own, think like, you have to be careful you know what I mean? because whatever affects what's going to happen with that south is also will be affected by what happens with us. We're all together. I don't really see us as that separate. And somebody, a, a f young founders are also just trying to find their way too. I don't think you, we can generalize like all of white people. Somebody who works for herself like me is, is affected too. You know, I was on a walk in Bronxville and I ran into two friends who um, don't have to worry about this problem. And they actually said like, well, we don't have to worry about us meaning them and me. I'm like, yeah, we have to worry about me too. I'm not, I'm not on a trust fund. I'm not somebody who could just say, oh, it's fine if I, we never make any money in 2020. I have salaries and I have, a, I have responsibilities. So I think everything affects everybody and in different ways. And it still affects white people. And I'm not one of those white people working really, really hard. So I, I think- have, I, 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 I agree with that. Issue, yeah. I'm not, I'm not trying to, disagree with that but i think that the ugly truth is that like throughout history the people who got the shit end of the stick and things like this are not people like you and me marie like and, and i'm very worried to see how that transpires even in cities in america like new orleans which is just like starting to to pick up on on COVID, like I think it's gonna it's, go across the board it didn't go much in yeah. africa at all did you notice how little in africa yeah. I think maybe yeah. malaria. It's interesting you said responsibility. And I think the kind of the correlation between the virus and like who's taking action and who's taking responsibility is also very similar to sustainability in a way. 
Um, because sustainability is literally that same kind of correlation, Sustain, um, responsibility and ethics towards kind of like our duty or our, um, let's say our responsibility for the earth, for the planet. You know, so those who ignore it, those who are kind of naive about what's actually going on are causing this big problem. So it's not just to say like a few of us. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. And it's yeah, education also, yeah. to turn it around. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I think if you look at like sort of like how we responded when China um, got hit first and we didn't, we didn't take action. We were like, oh, this is a problem there. And if you look at SARS, I mean, it wasn't that long ago and they were able to contain it, but because there wasn't enough action. And I think there is this Orientalism, there is this xenophobia, but I think what's special about this is that it is going to affect everyone. How can we like unite on that fact? Because the environment that's affecting everyone, the job loss, the insecurity, the not knowing what's happening next and the lack of information about how long this is going to last, how deep it's going to penetrate. That's what's going to be the uniting force that can like bring about that change and like take us to the next step because everyone's going to be affected by it, whether or not you're wealthy or not. And then it trickles down and then it affects the poor people more. But that's not to say that the wealthy people then like that, that they have to fire their workers. So it's sort of something that goes across class lines, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So well, one thing that was weird was when when this whole thing was happening in, in China. Right. And, and, you know, they shut down Wuhan. Right. And it was like a, people like a, people on Twitter, like laughed at it and made memes out of like, you know, Chinese people wearing like full on hazmat suits, like, and it was like Resident Evil. Right. It's like a video game. Like you shut off the whole city. But but, you know, now, like at, at that time, like I was wearing a mask because my family's from Hong Kong. And so like we know what happened with SARS. We know how dangerous it is. I was wearing a mask on the subway and literally people were moving away from me and like I'm wearing it so I can protect myself from you guys. But there, there is that like xenophobic thing. And I think in New York, I, like, because that's where I am, what is, what's scary is that we're about to hit this inflection point, right? I don't know when it's going to be, but like my friends are doctors and they're, they're at NYU and like, or whatever hospitals, like what's scary is people, we're, we're going to run out of supplies sooner than later, right? And, and we're, we're creating makeshift morgues because that many people are dying. At some point, we're going to be like Italy where we have to decide who gets to live, who gets to, who, who is going to inevitably die because there's not enough supplies for everyone else. At that point, the, the, like none of this matters. It doesn't matter like who you are, like how much money you have. You literally cannot buy more ventilators. You cannot buy more like doctors. Like we are going to be fucked for lack of better words, right? Like this is what's going to happen. Um, I, like how do we actually just like drive that point um, how do you even like, how do you even make sure that message comes across? Cause like I'm in Midtown, I walk, I walk down the street at like 11 PM and people are still out and about people like don't care. Like, I, I don't know how else to like, you know, I'm, I'm wearing a mask. I'm wearing gloves. Like I am full like paranoia or like, I, I, I don't want to affect other people. I don't want to affect my grandparents, my, my, my parents, like these are vulnerable populations. And it's not about me, but like everything you're reading on Twitter on, on, you know, uh, uh, uh there was an article in timeout like last week where someone was like, Oh, I I'm 20 years old. Like, it's not gonna, like, I don't care if I catch it, but it's not about you. It's about like everyone else that you can affect. I don't, I don't know how to like drive that point, um, home better. Like you can't articulate that better than like, I don't know. It's scary. Yeah. Very. <clears throat> Yeah, unfortunately, I think people like that need to have it personalized for them. Like, and it's, uh, you know, stories of people who are young, like maybe 25 or 30 who get it and die. Like that makes it real for them. There's somebody 18 in Bronxville dying right now. Yeah. You know, I think they need to be more aware. Again, everything goes back to education. Maybe they've just all, they may be in the seven stages of grief. They're still in the denial and they turn the television off and they're out walking around. So... Yeah, I agree with that. Cause it's like, I don't know that, like, I think like the, maybe COVID is like tar worse for the aging population, but, but age isn't a chronological thing. It's a biological factor, right? That's what age is. And you can be extremely unhealthy as many Americans are um, and have a higher biological age and therefore be more affected by something like COVID-19. So like, I, I think sometimes we even don't like really think about like who's susceptible and who's high risk and who's not because we just think, you know, like it's, it's everyone. It could be babies. That's yeah. That's the truth of it. It's like, there's so many, like there's an obesity problem in the United States 
people who are obese are biologically older. Chemically speaking, your cells are older because you've been putting your, your system through more duress that puts you at higher risk for things like this, you know? So uh, it's, it's unfortunate that that isn't that sort of knowledge base isn't out there more, you know, it, it needs to be. Yeah. It's been, um, Kenneth, to your point, so much has changed in two or three weeks. And I think even for Stuart as small business owners and residents of New York, um, and then having lived in China, so speaking really directly with friends there that were stuck on lockdown or had to evacuate, it became real a little bit sooner. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's been interesting to watch, A, because of exponential growth and how nothing, nothing happens till all of a sudden New York's on fire. Um, how long it's taken for different groups of people or different friends even, um, or different family members for this to become real or for them to take it seriously. Um, and someone actually posted in the Slack group we're all a part of, and Barnett, you mentioned the Global South, about how can we get ahead of this as like global citizens and help educate um, like countries and populations in the Global South now before it gets bad there. Um, knowing what we know kind of in Europe and in the US, is it creative campaigns? How can we while, while in shelter in place, help create campaigns that educate Latin America, South America, Africa, um, about what might be coming and the importance of locking down early. Because here in California, two weeks ago, Stuart was mentioning this yesterday, yeah. the mayor of San Francisco made the decision to shut down San Francisco and the Bay Area really early before de Blasio and Cuomo would agree to do so, even for New York. And it might be one of the single best public policy decisions of the last hundred years, because San Francisco was looking like it was going to be a hot spot worse than New York, and now it's not. Yeah, there's a quote that there's a quote that people keep like sending through, where it's like everything that you do before a pandemic uh, is seems like like craziness, seems like overkill and over the top, and then you know afterwards you realize that that everything you've done is just not not quite good enough. Um, so it's just that like putting that in, in perspective as you think about yeah. like exactly the measures that you're taking. Um, but I think it'd be interesting actually even with Better World, Barnett, I don't know if there's any interest to work on that campaign to help yeah. educate communities about like the importance of sheltering in place, staying inside, like flattening the curve, like even far ahead of time before it even gets there. Um, I think for us yeah. it's been interesting and it was kind of scary this week to have calls with all of our partners in Brazil about yeah. shutting down. And look, at least Brazil is shutting down a bit early, but it would absolutely devastate a country like Brazil where the healthcare system is not. Yeah. I mean, not that the U.S. has a great healthcare system as we've seen mm -hmm. um, over the past yeah. week, but it would, you know, be devastating to some of these developing countries. Yeah, and it's also That's interesting as you sort of are touching on the idea of like, when do we judge a government versus a people? Like, it was, it's so easy for Americans as, to be like, oh, like the government of China, like they, we, don't, uh, we don't appreciate their policy, so therefore they must be doing something wrong. And I think it's this massive wake up call that like Taiwan right now, I have a lot of friends that live there and like, they're doing really well. Like they have like contained it. They've, it's the community outbreak and if you're flying into Taiwan, like you need to be monitored by the CDC and they've contained it in most of their areas. And yet three weeks ago, we were so judgmental about what, I think it's, it is xenophobic, it is orientalist, but I think the way we capitalize on that is finding the uniting force and the reality and the scary reality that this is going to affect all of us in some way. You might not get sick, but you're going to know someone that does most likely. And I think if we're looking at California versus New York, I mean, that's the perfect case of the ineptitude of Cuomo and de Blasio do not get along. And they've made that policy very clear over the time that there's this constant ego breach between who's in charge of the city and not versus in California, you know, like LA quickly followed after San, San Francisco. And there was this sort of, how do we allow our policies to cloud like actually what's good for the common sense and for the common good exactly it, it's been an interesting watching city versus state versus federal yeah versus individual yeah guys this has been really great i've loved this we're at like an hour 20 um i think now is kind of a good time to wrap up this has been awesome yeah what i'll do too is i'll i'll continue to kind of the chat and, and within the Slack group, and we can we can action off of that. I, I just you know, I can also send a recap too if that's helpful. Yeah. But this was awesome.
Yeah, thank you so much for inviting thank you. Uh, for inviting us. Yeah. Yeah, great. thanks for hosting. Everybody needs to go check out It's Better World podcast. It's a great yeah. group of people they have on there. We can't wait for the platform to launch. Yeah, we're I think we out can. of this, now we need um, an ICO for um, natural resources in the rainforest. You guys need to connect on helping farmers raise money for coffee. And silos. And so we cool. might need to do a creative campaign to help the global south. Yeah. I don't know what else came out yeah. of that. Line it all together. Okay, it'll be, it'll be in the slack group. <laughs> all right. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Bye. weekend. Bye. Everybody stay safe. Good night. Be safe.